Hey, I want to offer my welcome uh, also to all of you, especially you new uh, newcomers or first-time guests. I've met some of you who are first-time. I know it takes a lot of courage uh, to come to a big church here like this and not knowing exactly where you're heading, so way to go. You did it. I want to welcome everybody who, we have hundreds throughout the morning will be in the chapel as well as our sanctuaries continue to be, uh, be renovated, refreshed, and a lot of folks that perhaps are online or listening to this podcast later on, we're We're just trying to put this on blast and for everyone to know of the life-changing power of God. The thing that we uh, desire most for you, we hope you've been welcomed in and all that good stuff. But more than that, we just hope that you will know how much the Lord loves you. That today will be a life-changing day for you. And you'll discover how much Christ loves you and what he's done for you. Today, we're going to continue, of course, this series uh, in his image. Today, we're going to talk about what happens when we get a little twisted. Our desires get twisted and we get off track of what it is and what it means to be fully integrated, embodied, uh, fully present humans. Because we're all prone to to slip away. We're going to talk about uh, addiction today. Uh, Now, before you think, well, I'm not an addict, not so fast. The Bible says in Romans uh, 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And apart from the power of God in our lives, we're all, we are all addicted to whatever desires we have within us. And the problem for many of us is we don't do the deep work that it takes to overcome our addictions. I love that Paul, arguably the greatest you know, Christian who ever lived in Romans 7, he says, I find myself doing the very things I don't want to do. In fact, he gets it because the spirit of God's in him as it is in those who follow Jesus. And he says this, I find myself doing the very things I hate. Anybody in the room? Do we have any addicts in the room? Mass confession. We all have go-to sins. Y'all, y'all lying to yourself right now. Um, <laughs> That's a problem. We're going to talk about that. Uh, we got to be honest. We got to get honest. And today we are praying. We have prayed this morning that the Lord would do a work now, like right now, like right now. Today, we would give up those go to sins and we all have them. And what I want you to do in order to apply this, always teaching towards application. I want you to think, what is your go to sin? Throughout the morning, I want you to think about that. Let the Spirit speak to you. It could be a lot of things, just to prime the pump. It could be that you have fits of anger. You, you say things over and over again you wish you didn't say. Coming back to apologize. Maybe it's, maybe it's pornography. Maybe it's your phone. Now I'm preaching. Maybe it's your screens. Maybe it's your, your go-to is something that is some diversion. Maybe you're trying to medicate some pain in your life and you know it. Maybe you drink too much. Maybe you're, maybe you're lazy. I mean, there's all kinds of possibilities here. And the day, today, what we want to see happen, we're praying for the Spirit of God. We've prayed for you that you would wake up today. In 1 Peter chapter 5, it says this, be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a lion looking for someone to devour. This says a lot. One thing, we, there's an enemy coming after us, and we are in a spiritual battle. And so today what I'm going to do is, I want today to be a day for all of us, myself included. We would not leave this place without drawing a line and saying, I'm done. I don't have to live with that particular sin in my life anymore. And it is true. The power of God gives us the possibility to overcome. So I want you to turn to James chapter one. I'm going to set this up and then we're going to introduce our guest for today. James chapter one. Everybody turn there. Verses 12 through 15. There's a lot of passages we we could go to. The Bible speaks to addiction a lot more than you realize. Uh, We put that term on a lot of things, but you see it throughout scripture. We're going to talk today about overcoming addiction. Okay. Again, we're all addicts. Every single one of us. And what we'll see in this passage, three things I want you to see if you're taking notes here. Uh, The perseverance, um, the blessing of perseverance, the first thing. Then the source of temptation, important to understand the battle we're in. And then finally, the consequence of unchecked desires and how serious this topic is tonight or this morning. Um, So first of all, I said tonight, we're going to be together Wednesday night talking about this, diving a lot deeper. We'll talk more about that in a moment. Uh, First of all, the blessing of perseverance. Okay, Paul has been talking about trials and temptations, and they are similar 
but there's nuanced differences, okay? And we'll, we'll talk about that today. Look at verse 12. Blessed is the man. This is the same word Jesus uses in the, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, the Beatitudes, okay? The good life belongs to the man who remains steadfast, the woman who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Okay, what he's saying here is be alert, be watchful. Again, today's a wake up call. Some of us have fallen asleep in our sin and we've drifted and we continue to drift. And it's going to do and is doing greater damage in our lives than we even know. You never sin in a vacuum. Your sin always impacts others. And he says, you're going to get the crown of life. Now, the language here is not a crown like a king or a queen. This is a crown like a wreath. You probably know this. Athletes back in the day. We just finished the Olympics here. This was a garland that was put on a victorious, okay, athlete. So it's a crown of honor and a crown of victory. Isn't that what overcoming temptation feels like? right? Like you're tempted and then you overcome, you obey and you're like, yes. But here's the question I have for you. Are you really in this fight? Are you truly fighting off sin in your life? Because this is the sanctification of our lives all the way till we see Jesus face to face. We are seeking to become just like him. That's what it is to be a disciple. So remember the blessing of perseverance in those moments of temptation. That's important. Secondly, look at this, the source of temptation. Look at what Paul, uh, uh, James says here. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. Like, don't say God's trying to trip me up. Why is this happening? For God cannot be tempted with evil. Okay, he's impervious to evil. He has nothing to do with evil. So he says he, he tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Okay, again, these word, the word trial is, is parosmos in the, in, the, in the Greek. The word can mean trial or temptation. That's why you see both of these here in James, depending on the context. So he kind of shifts from, okay, stay strong, persevere. But he's talking now about temptation that comes our way. This is now tempting, being tempted to sin. And he's saying that, listen, there's only one person to blame. There is an evil one who comes after us, but it's you and your evil desires. It's not God, but God does test us. Okay. Difference between testing and temptation. He does put us to the test. And here's what we, we've talked about often here. Um, oftentimes we're tempted to sin and we think, ah, oh, our mindset is, our neural pathways run to, ah, oh, temptation, here comes sin. And some of us, this is why we're addicted to particular go-to sins. Ah, oh, here comes temptation, there I go. Instead of, ah, oh, here comes tem temptation, not an opportunity for sin, opportunity for obedience. There's an opportunity here to say yes to God. And this is going to happen to you all day long today. It's going to happen all week long. You're going to have an opportunity. This is a discipleship. Will I go the way of Jesus or will I go the other way? So the blessing of perseverance helps us remember the crown of life and that we're going to honor him in every way. The source of temptation is that we're in an evil, we're in a battle. We're in a war is what it is. And then thirdly, I want you to see this, the consequence of unchecked desire, how serious this is today for each of us to get honest. Verse 15, then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. Look at this. Sin has deadly consequences. Sin by its nature is self-destructive and ultimately leads to death spiritually even physical death. It can happen, right? And ultimately. But check this out. James is saying, lust gets pregnant, has a baby, named sin. Sin grows up and becomes the killer. That sounds like addiction. Because that's exactly what he's talking about. It's this disordered love, okay? Twisted desires that could even be God-given desires, but going to the wrong source Okay, for our fulfillment, not God, and it leads us to become addicts and sin again by its nature is self-destructive. But this passage also points to the hope that we have of cutting sin off at its root and not allowing it to grow. But the only way this can happen in our lives, friends, and I hope you know this, and if you, if you are still struggling to believe this, the only way that you can overcome sin in your life and live the good life that you've been called to live is to give your life fully to Jesus. Only Jesus can transform your heart. 
Because addiction is not behavior management. In fact, we're going to talk about that today. Being a functional alcoholic. Like you're a functional sinner. I suppose we are uh, in varying degrees, right? But today is the day when we decide we're going to cut this thing off at the root right now. And we're going to end it. And today we're going to walk out saying, I'm, I'm going to live a different life. And only the power of God can do that. This is our story. Every one of us. And this is the story of our guest, Michael Moulton. Wow, wow, wow. Bro, it's so great to have you here. Good to see you, Doc. Thanks, man. Have a seat. That was tough. So you, you reminded me this week. We've known each other for 24 years. 24 years. With lots 27 of mug shots. You didn't do a very good job 24 years ago. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was his pastor. And yeah, you went off the rails while I was your pastor. You know, I, I got emotional just for, for a second. I, was, I couldn't even look at Stacy because in 2002, um, when I went to Betty Ford, um, for the first time, and I always say Betty Ford because I want people to know I went to Betty Ford because that's where important people like me go. That's what I really thought of myself. But when I came back from Betty Ford, I came back home, and when I op- walked into my home, you and Stacy were there with some other church members. So I remember that. Thank you. It's been a journey, man. It has. It it's been has. A journey. It has. Now to see what God's doing. So I'm so thrilled. A lot of our people uh, know you. You've spoken to New Hope Class Connect yeah. Group and others, but love that um, class. I am so thrilled that my people um, get to know you. You're one of my dear friends, and I yes. praise God for you. You've taught me so much. Huh. Uh, I've quoted you. You know. So we'll. Um, dive into some of, of how you've impacted my life. But uh, we're going to do this Wednesday night as well. So we've got a brief yeah. period of time here. Cool. But um, I hope you'll come back Wednesday night. There's more to his story. Uh, in fact, Judge Bennett, I think, is going to be here Wednesday night. Yeah, she will be. Um, She's and my professional photographer. It's going to be, oh, wow. <laughs> it's going to be incredible. So let's dive straight in. Um, you know, uh, we talked recently, we talked this week, but uh, I was wrestling going into this sermon for real. Like, what is the difference between habitual sin and, and addiction, like, how do you know? I was thinking, there, there's clinical addiction. How, how do you define uh, addiction? Good question. You know, um, you know when we think of addiction, um, we automatically go to the, the stigma, drug addict, alcoholic, or, you know. The, Some guy that's tatted up or something. Yeah, tatted up. Yeah, I right. got, that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. When I got incarcerated, I had to blend in. <laughs> but um, Missionary. That's yeah. Good. Yep. But, um. You know, we think of the man or the woman underneath the bridge, you know, and today I realize that the only difference between, you know, me and the man underneath the bridge is the bridge, you know. Mm. But addiction, there's a stigma to it, but um, I, I, when I speak, I, I love to talk about what is addiction? What, what is it? What is the actual definition of addiction? And I've come up with this, is that addiction is a, it's a person, it's a place, it's a thing, and here's a scary one, or a thought that becomes my source. Mm. Person, place, thing, or a thought that becomes my source. The word addiction is the street name for spiritual stronghold. Mm. That's what it is. Mm. So we, what we've done is we've taken and we've changed the wordsmithing of it so I can justify my actions. So it's, you know, it's addiction. So if the addict, so if the addict is like some homeless person out there under the bridge, then it removes me. I'm not an addict, right? right? Is the mindset. Right. And then you were, you've helped me this week. We were talking about this. You say there's no difference, like habitual sin and addiction. What's the difference? Nothing. Nothing. I mean, it, you know, it, it's, um, you know, one thing is, is that I, I noticed that we have to stop focusing on addiction and look at why the addiction, okay? Mm-hmm. Sin and addiction the same thing, all right? It is the only disease that has to be self-diagnosed. And that's what's so frustrating about it. So why is there a stigma with drug addicts and alcoholics? And we put them over here and say, they're just sick people, bad people. Well, the reason why is because my behaviors and actions bother people because they actually see their own actions live on stage, but their visible thing that they seek to change that feeling may not be drugs and alcohol, but it could be something else. So we got to get to the invisible, mm. right? We got to get underneath and see the real problem. So I have been, gosh, I went to a meeting with you. Some of us have been 12 step, you know, meetings. I've gone to see friends, get a coin, first year coin, yeah. you know, or something like that. 
to celebrate. I'm so struck by the honesty in the room. I mean, that's what hit me. I was like, man, this is church is what this is. Yeah. Or what church ought to be, right? Yeah. And we tend to not be so honest. But um, tell me this. Um, Nietzsche's the one who, who said that insanity is, you know, doing the same thing over and over again, mm-hmm. uh, seeking the same results, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you, you, That's not the definition. What, what is insanity? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over, knowing what the result's going to be. Oh. Knowing what the result is going to That's be. That's craziness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here's a question I, I had for you privately, and I'm just going to lay it out here. Um, what... Describe what some of us might be uh, in particular sins. This plays out in a lot of ways, but I hear the term uh, a functional alcoholic. <laughs> like he's a functional alcoholic. Yeah. Tell, tell me, is there such a thing or what, what is, how do you talk about Not that? for me. You know, um, you know, functional alcoholic. If I have to announce that I'm a functional alcoholic, it means I have a problem with alcohol. You know, I don't make it well known that I'm a functional ice cream eater. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't yeah. have to make that known because because what addiction? You don't have to make that known. Right? No, yeah. you know, sin, addiction. Okay, what it is? It's a mental obsession, and it's something that I mentally obsess about over and over that has a hold of me. It owns me, and I'm willing to go to any lengths to get that fix. Mm-hmm. And I'm powerless over it, and my life becomes unmanageable as a result of that. And it could be work. It could be. Power, it could be shopping, it could be gambling, it could be golf, it could be all these things. It's like, God dang, M2, I mean, how do I live life and have fun, okay? Mm-hmm. And what it is is that we recognize that we're doing it. See, before I never could recognize the behaviors. What's the difference then between a, a, a social drinker mm. and an alcohol? I know I'm, I know I'm running alcohol, but we're trying to apply this. It's okay, board. no. It, What's the difference between social? It's a great question because... Um, the difference between a social drinker and an alcoholic, an alcoholic will drink before the event. And if they find out that there's no alcohol at the event, they don't go. Or if they go, they stash alcohol, go to the bathroom and drink it or drink after and they hide it. The social drinker, the event is more important than the drink. They're not thinking about it. They're like, okay. I mean, they're not driving to the event going, golly, I hope they have you know, alcohol there. It's just not even a thought in their mind. So what is the, um, you talk about getting to the real source of the problem. Uh, maybe a twofold question. Why is it that so many of us who've experienced trauma mm. as you have in your life, mm-hmm. abuse in your mm-hmm. past, mm-hmm. why is it, and we all have varied you know, relative trauma in our lives and our past. Maybe we didn't feel unloved, I didn't feel whatever. Um, we're trying to medicate a pain or something there. Talk to us about that. Um, why do so many people who experience trauma tend to have a trigger towards addiction? And what, what is it to get to the real source of the problem? Well, my personal experience in my story was I wasn't a believer. You know, so I was always seeking visible things to fix my invisible problems. Mm-hmm. And, and my story is growing up, I had true criminal childhood trauma right? And then I finally found something that would ease the pain and comfort. It goes back to what I'm saying is that we have to stop focusing on addiction and start focusing on why the addiction, all right? And trauma. Trauma is always the underlying reason. And I would seek these things, chemicals and substances, invisible things, because I was trying to accomplish one thing. I was trying to accomplish, I wanted to ease the pain and the suffering, the pain and the suffering. Um, so it takes a deep, deeper work. I mean, that's the thing. Uh, habitual sins in my life that I've overcome or, or wrestling with, um, it takes a deeper dive. Why am I doing this? Not just, this is bad for me. I need to buck up. I need to work harder, get better, mm-hmm. right? And for all of us who are in habitual sin, um, I'd ask, how's that working out for you? Mm-hmm. Working harder, getting better. And not, not having done the hard work of talking to others, you know, what are, what are some of those steps we could take to get to the root of the problem? Great question. You know, 
my entire life, I was always, when, when someone asked me, like, Michael, it's a cycle. We see it coming. We see it happening, you know? And they would just say, why do you drink? Why do you make these decisions? Why do you do drugs? And it would make me so angry inside. It would make me so angry inside, and I would just steer away from those people, okay? Here is true honesty. True honesty is simply the three words that I said after my 27th mugshot, and I had this spiritual awakening, mm-hmm. and it's this. I don't know. I don't know. It's okay to say that. That's, I don't know why I'm doing the things that's I'm at doing. The root, that's the first thing then is, that's true I've honesty. got to admit, okay, well, I'm powerless over this thing, um, and I, I don't know, which then should lead us to seek help, right? That's right. That's the next step. Right. So what was it for you at the root of, of your issues? How could you name it? Like, what was it at the root of it all, when you, when you got honest, um, you had a lot of, I think, built up resentment in your life. And- Absolutely. And it's all fear-driven. It was all fear-driven. You know, um, fear, the acronym of fear is false evidence appearing real, right? Mm-hmm. Fear is not real. It's when I'm in the future alone in my head. That's where fear lies. That's where Satan wants me to be. He wants me to be in the future alone in my head. If I don't do anything with fear... Because it's an opportunity. If I don't do anything with fear, it turns into resentment. If I don't do anything with resentment, it turns into anger, mm. rage, isolation, paranoia, and I start drinking. Wow. What is the solution to fear? And no one's ever gotten this right. The solution to fear is real simple. Talk about it. And say, I don't know. Yeah, that's good. I don't know why I'm feeling we, the way I'm. We, talk, we say this often, um, I'm only as sick as my secrets. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, and when you bring it out into the open... This is, and this is where the spirit starts to convict all of us. The courageous moment is when you say, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm doing what I'm doing. I need to get underneath it and I need help. Mm -hmm. And and when you get sin, it's why confession is so powerful, Mm -hmm. right? Um, When you get sin out in the open, bring it to the light, it can't grow. Certain things grow in the dark. Sin grows in the dark. That's right. So... Uh, tell me this. You, we'll talk about this later at another time. You're coming to our Men's Connect lunch, by yeah, the way. Yeah, can't wait for that. September 12th. With Bring our, it home. With our men. Uh, guys, women, you know, make sure you get this on his calendar because you say that the problem in our culture is really not addiction. There's another problem. What is it? Yeah, our, our crisis today is the missing man. The missing man. We have a lot of males, but, the, but we were missing the missing man. When I was incarcerated, um, I, I, I noticed, including myself... 100% of my cellies, my cellmates, the inmates, had little or no relationship with their father. Mm. Not one father ever came and visited people. It was always the grandmother, the mom, mm. the aunt, the baby mama, you know, whatever it is that came and visited, mm-hmm. but there was never a father yeah. present. Wow. And it's time for men to take back the dinner table. It's good. That's good. That is the roof. We have a messed up man making a contribution to his family. We're going to create a messed up family. Mm -hmm. And it goes to the neighborhood, the city, the church, the county, the state, the country, and the world. That's that's powerful. We'll talk about that at the Men's Connect. That's good. Um, Okay. We got time for for one last question or or really thought. You, um, one of the most impactful things that you share with me, this has been some several, a few years ago. We're together having lunch and we're talking about this. And I just asked you straight up. Um, Michael, help me. How do you do this? Hmm. How do you do this? And I've, I've quoted you here I've, I've, and given you credit, all the things, um, to say, um, man, how do you stay clean? Like, like how, how are you able to overcome addiction in your life? And, and I can say it for you. You tell me. You, you said, here, what's the key? I keep reading who we serve. Okay. When I'm serving and getting out of self, just like I'm doing right now, I'm not thinking about the future right now. I'm not thinking about the past right now. I'm right here right now because that's where God's at. It's so safest place in the world. It's in the, in the present. Right in the here. way I've, I've parsed it out, you said the key is to live in the present. Yes. Right? Because if you go into the past. If I go in the past alone in my head, I get, um, I get depressed, depression, resentful, regrets. angry, oh. regrets. And if you go into the future... If I shift the view in my head, then I jump over to the future alone in my head. I get fearful, anxious, worry, you know, all this stuff. So I do this game back and forth in my head. Meanwhile, 
The now is right here, mm-hmm. okay? And so in order to get into the now, I took my first drink, ah, boom. And I had this euphoria of being in the now, okay? Playing golf, exercising, whatever it is to get that euphoria of being in the now. So how do I stay there? I do more. Mm. I do more until um, God allows it to happen. He'll, he'll, have, he'll allow me to have all the control I want for everything to get completely out of control for me to hit my knees and turn to him to realize I never had control in the first place. So, the, yeah, the takeaway for me and what I've <laughs> preached uh, literally to our people is so helpful, so freeing, is to live in the present. Yeah. Because uh, yeah, going back to the past or the future, I mean, you, and we do this jumping around. I need to get out of the past, so I'm going to go to the future. Yikes, that's not so good. Yep. And it's to live in the present and then to, in the present, it's to serve, get outside of myself and serve others where everything, all this comes back to. And we know that every 12-step program comes back to, to God and to Jesus as the source, right? Mm-hmm. He's the one who said, well, you know, what's the greatest commandment? How do I live this life? Love God, love others. When do I do that? Now. Right. And it means that now, for me, it's to be fully present, focused on whomever God's put in front of me, mm-hmm. um, and whatever he's called me to do in the moment. Mm-hmm. And that has been so freeing. And in the moment, he's calling us to serve others. That's the way to live, right? right. So it all comes back to Jesus, doesn't right. it? So we're going to talk a lot more about this on Wednesday night. Come, we'll be right here at six o'clock and uh, you'll be able to bring your questions as well. We're going to hear more of his story and he's going to do a little teaching moment, but then we're going to have a, the bulk of the time will be a Q&A, okay? Let's thank Michael, everybody. Thank Michael for being with us Thanks, man. today, man. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Praise the Lord. All right. So, hey, before I uh, hand it off to our, uh, our folks in the, in the chapel, I just want to offer this, really to, to land this in 2 Corinthians 10, uh, 3 through 5. He says, for, for, for those, though we, we live in the world, we don't wage war as the world does. He talks about spiritual strongholds and overcoming sin. And the way that we do this is not through worldly weapons. It's through the spiritual weapons that God has given us which include prayer, his word, all kinds of things. He says, this is how we break down and demolish strongholds in our lives. And he says, we, we demolish arguments that come at us. When the evil one is telling us, we, we need to do this or do that, or you're not enough, you're not loved enough, or whatever the thing is, when we do the deep work, he says, we hold every captive to make it obedience to Christ. Obedient to Christ. And, and here's the challenge before, um, before we close this time. Many of us, we have the tools, everything we need for life and godliness. But one of those great tools is to do it together. So one of the ways you can draw the line today is to say, I'm going to stop dating the church. I'm, I'm going to commit. I'm stepping in. What, what are you going to do is my question. And for some of you, it's that. You've been coming here. You need to make a commitment to join the fellowship of the church. Now, if that sounds strange to you, before that, certainly there's a, there's a decision you need to make, which is to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. He died on the cross for your sin so that you wouldn't have to carry the shame of your sin and your failure. He took it upon himself and he nailed it to the cross. He was buried and he rose again so that you could have a future hope and a resurrected life like him. Dying to yourself daily to live for him all the days of your life and into eternity. If you've never received Christ, today is your day. And we're going to be here for you to help guide you and help you. We want to help you find a connect group to get in. Some of you need to say, I'm going to act. I'm going to do something. But maybe for many of us, it's simply saying, I'm going to tell somebody. I'm going to talk. I got to get this out in the open. And for some of us here today, that, that might be easy. You have loving people around you who are going to love you in. Others, it might be the most courageous, difficult thing you've ever done in your life. And it's going to save your life. And today is the day. You don't have to live this way anymore because the power of God is here to change your life. Okay? So I want to pray and then we'll continue on this morning. Lord, we thank you for this time. We praise you for not just Michael's life. We leave uh, today into this day. Not simply, wow, what a great story, or what a great man, but what a great Savior. 
What a great God who can do the same thing in my life. And so, Lord, we give you our lives. We belong to you. And we turn to you. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.